Hello and welcome to the podcast, Every Moment is Sacred, where we interweave meditation and healing into everyday life. I am your host, Rain Elizabeth Stickney. Now, let us begin. Hey, welcome back. I have made an important discovery. And I've made this discovery through podcasting. It turns out narcissism is an important topic. It's important to discuss. It's important to hear stories of. And for this show, Every Moment is Sacred, you beautiful listeners out there, listen to episodes that address narcissism. So I decided to put these three episodes together where three different women have chosen to tell their stories of being raised by a narcissistic parent. We had an episode long ago, number 11, and that episode was with Sarah Kastelnik, and she shares beautifully and vulnerably about being raised by a narcissistic father, and that is the episode that is airing today. I am replaying it because last Friday, we heard from Donna Fields, and that was episode 29. Her story was titled, the witch is the heroine. And Donna spoke about being raised by a narcissistic mother. And prior to that, episode 27 was with Bria Burton. The title of that episode was Changing the World One Candle at a Time. And Bria's story even involves some domestic violence. And she was raised by a narcissistic father. So this unfolding of the importance of addressing narcissism shows me how precious it is to remember empathy. So one of the things that happens when a person has narcissistic tendencies or a full-blown personality disorder or anything in between, there is a lack of empathy. And that disruption of being able to empathize with another person causes harm or has the potential to. And these three stories are stories where there was harm. There was emotional harm in all the stories and there was some physical harm in a couple of the stories. So I wanted to gather these three episodes together for those of you who are interested in narcissism and you can listen to the three stories together. They're easy to find this way. I have a lot of colleagues and friends who are licensed professionals, and I'm looking to interview some of them so they can give a professional perspective of what they understand narcissism to be, what best is done when somebody finds themselves in a narcissistic relationship or if they find that they're having narcissistic tendencies themselves, which would be wonderful to notice because at least sometimes the narcissist is not likely to have that kind of self-reflection. It takes a lot of empathy to look at oneself. We will hear from some experts coming up soon. I'm not sure when, but that is on my list of to-dos. Sarah gratefully shares this episode as a replay. She graciously and wonderfully shares it again with all of you. And there's nothing to be changed or added, but I do want to let you know of a free guide that she is offering. If you haven't heard her episode before, I'll share that Sarah has a wonderful podcast that's called Mind Body Home the Living Elemental podcast. I listen to this show. It's wonderful. And she goes through 
the different aspects of feng shui and how to create sacred, beautiful spaces within your home. And she's offering a free guide, five ways to uplift your home's energy now. So that link will be in the show notes and you can easily sign up to receive that guide. You can find her podcast wherever you like listening to podcasts. Again, her name is Sarah Kastelnik and her show is Mind, Body, Home, the Living Elemental Podcast. Now, just as it is, I'm happy to share with you a replay of episode 11 that is now becoming episode 31, and you have sequentially on Fridays, episode 27, 29, and 31, all addressing different aspects of being raised by a narcissistic parent. And just one more tidbit, each of these women, they're in a different decade of their life. So it's also interesting for those who are interested to hear how somebody in their 20s would reflect on their childhood, how somebody in their 40s would reflect on their childhood, and how somebody in their 60s would reflect on their childhood, all with a similar theme, all brilliant, all sharing wisdom and compassion, all amazing people. And for today, here is Sarah Kastelnik. And you'll hear the intro, just like the first episode. You'll hear everything the way it was before. So enjoy. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Every moment is sacred, is offered freely, and your support truly makes a difference. To make a contribution, go to patreon.com slash rain elizabeth. You may also contribute and become part of the community through my website at rainelizabeth.org. Hey, I am so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Today we have a wonderfully insightful conversation with Sarah Kastelnik. She is an interior designer. She is a mother and a wife. She is a wonderful, beautiful, wise person. She owns her own business, Jade Scott Design. She's very talented in the realm of feng shui and creating safe spaces in the home that are essential to well-being. Sarah also has a story to share. She has a story to share about her own life growing up with a narcissistic parent. I feel so touched and so honored to have this healing conversation with Sarah and to be able to share it with you. Stories of childhood trauma are very dear and near to my heart as I also grew up with significant childhood wounds and trauma. So when someone reaches out to me or I have the opportunity to connect with someone around such a vulnerable topic as how one was raised and offering some insights about the healing and growth about moving through difficulty with grace and ease and the twists and turns any human life goes through. I just feel so vulnerably touched, honored, and the deepest respect blooms within me. So I invite you to bloom your beautiful hearts with respect and your own honesty and vulnerability about whatever journey you've had in your world so far, or perhaps allowing this conversation to touch on some understanding about anyone else in your life who might have had an interesting growing up story that gave them something significant to overcome when they were ready. Sarah offers compassion not only for herself, but for all of her family members. And I'm so deeply excited to share this empathetic, conscious, loving conversation with you about growing up with a narcissistic parent. 
we jump right into the conversation. So take a deep breath and here we go. I think a lot of like a lot of people who have had childhood trauma, there's not like a great recollection of childhood. So it's kind of hard to start there. So maybe we can work backwards in a sense, or maybe I'll even start with, you know, the family dynamics and the roles. So there's me. I have a younger brother who were seven years apart. And then my two parents, they married young. They were actually married in their senior year of high school because Mm. they got pregnant with me. So (laughs) from inception, I was unplanned, right? So you can probably already guess where I'm kind of going (laughs) with that a little bit. My parents have always assured me that even though I was unplanned, I was wanted, right? But when you grow up thinking you're not, regardless of what they say, it sticks with you for a really long time. And then when you 40 years later have this awareness that I really was just like kind of used like and wasn't given like an opportunity to be a child, like you find with a narcissist that you are kind of there as an extension of them, that your needs aren't really important, that your reality needs to mirror theirs. So... I mean, that's just like (laughs) tip of the iceberg, essentially. But from a role perspective, um, I was the oldest. Again, my brother is seven years apart. And I was more of the rebellious one. And I didn't really play that role until probably like middle school. So like preteens, when there's a lot of angst, really trying to find your independence. Living with a narcissist does not like that, (laughs) right? Like, how dare you, which is, you know, probably a really famous line I've heard growing up. And my brother was more of the peacemaker. He was a very quiet kid, shy kid. Looking back on his childhood now, I can see why, like he never wanted to ruffle any feathers. You know, he saw how my dad spoke to me and knew that he wanted no parts of that. And my mother's role so obviously you can tell my my father is who I'm speaking about as, as playing the narcissist role. But my mother, she grew up with a narcissist. Her mother was mm. extremely narcissistic and, and mentally, emotionally abusive to all of her children. So my mother was raised by one and then married one. And she was, I think she was emotionally cut off really early on. And so there was no it's almost like she didn't protect me, or at least that was my reality was that I never felt like she protected me. But now that I have all of this awareness around what's going on, I realize like she didn't have the capacity to, (laughs) you know, she was not raised to, you know, self-soothe and understand what was happening. And then she just married right into it in high school, like had a baby and now had to be a mother on her own. Like, so I have a lot of compassion for my mother. Although growing up, I didn't. Her and I were actually the ones that butted head the most Mm -hmm. because if if the attention was on my mother and I, then it was like my dad could come in and save the day. He could be the like cool dad who always said yes. And here's a couple Mm -hmm. bucks. Go walk to the ice cream shop, you know, because they do that. They have this like way of luring you in when when it's convenient for them. And that's the that's the tricky part that I think I realized later on in life was I started struggling with like how much of that side of him was authentic and how much of it was just like playing around in his, in his game or his reality, you know? And so I had, I had to like process a lot of that because it's not all bad memories, but are the good ones like authentic and truly loving? Like, so I had to kind of work through a lot of that too. So those are kind of the roles as far as where we all stood. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed a lot of times, you know, my dad would, you know, treat my mother, like you weren't allowed to really have your own voice, your own opinion. It was his way. It was, you know, and that was in not just family dynamics and, and those types of things, but it just in general, you know, when it came to politics or social events or current events, things in the news or the media, it was, 
if you thought differently than him, you were crazy. You were delusional. Your reality is skewed. Like, and I remember having memories of that as a child thinking, oh, that doesn't, doesn't sound right. Or, or realizing there's no resonance in that for me, but I played along, you know, it was just easier. He had a lot of anger issues. Well, it still does. Well, actually I think he's calmed in his age, but still struggles with anger, you know, drop one thing on the floor and it's like explosive. So there was a lot of walking on eggshells mm -hmm. as a child, things like that. There was never, I don't want to say there was never physical abuse, but mm -hmm. it was mostly mental and emotional, you mm -hmm. know, just completely invalidating your feelings. You know, if you really needed anything, it was, you were more of just being a pain you know, a thorn in their mm -hmm. side type of thing. So the interesting part is, and I know the word narcissism is like really tossed around these days. And I think it's probably a good thing because I think so many of us have struggled not realizing what, what we're dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, and just trying to raise ourselves and not, you know, so many people I think live with a lack of self-confidence and self-awareness there as adults, you know, and I think that I truly believe that as humans, we kind of come collectively to help each other out. And so I think there's just this huge awareness around it. But at the time, I'd say probably three years ago, I started working with an intuition coach and we really started honing our intuition and just starting to listen to it more. And that was a huge way for me to get back to a trust, a trusting of myself. But this is before mm -hmm. I was even aware of what was going on with my father. And so I was developing, you know, my intuition and I was laying in bed one night and I couldn't, I was tossing, turning, sleeping, not able to fall asleep. And the word narcissist or narcissism popped in my head. And I decided to follow that because what I knew was intuition speaks to you is like a drop in, right? First thought, best thought. And I decided to go down the Google rabbit hole, we'll call it. And I was in shock literally in shock because my perception of a narcissist personality was, I don't know if you've ever read um, the Christian Grey books, the 50 Shades of Grey. They were really popular oh, maybe like 10 years ago. I've heard Christian of Christian Grey, mm -hmm. right? Like wealthy, good looking, arrogant, pompous, <laughs> has it all, right? That is what I pictured a narcissist person to be. And honestly, I never knew that a female could exhibit those traits, maybe in a, maybe in a way, but I always kind of associated to being a male. And when I went down that Google rabbit hole, my dad checked like every single box and I never knew this about narcissism. Mm. And I remember just like kind of dropping my head in my hands and just started sobbing. And it was like, I was sobbing like tears of relief. Like, I'm not crazy. Like he, this is him. Like this is his doing. Like it was, it was maddening for so long that there was just such this sense of relief. And that was about a year and a half ago. So my like awakening to this really is rather recent. And that's where I've kind of been. And I've been obsessed with researching it, understanding it and I finally feel like I'm at a space now where I can, ex I, I've, you know, it's, it's funny with these relationships, especially being your parents. Like, I feel like I've gone through these stages of grief with my now alive, still alive parents. Mm -hmm. And that's been challenging because to date, we don't, I don't really have much contact with them, which is tough when you have two kids and they're young under both under 10 and they don't really understand you know, what's happening. They understand very small bits, but that's kind of where I am. So it's, it's like, I'm still healing. I've had my awakening to it. I have an understanding I've accepted it. And I have really good days where I feel really powerful. And I'm like, you know, no, I've put up these boundaries. And for anyone listening, you never use the word boundaries with a narcissist because <laughs> they will rip you to shreds, right? Because they don't like that. They don't like those you know, human psyche words, they're, they're not allowed They're They're, they're not relevant to them. So, mm -hmm. but then I also have days where I'm just sad, you know, I'm sad. I'm grieving the loss of my parents, grieving who I always wanted them to be. And I know they'll never mm -hmm. be that, but I think doing this, like talking 
about it, sharing stories. That's probably the biggest reason why I wanted to share because that's been helpful for me is listening to other people's stories, following, you know, mental health experts and just hearing them talk about it so that it's just more validation because Mm -hmm. if there's anything we need, it's like a return to self, like trusting yourself, loving yourself, understanding that like what you didn't get, you can give to yourself now Mm -hmm. or, and, or through your kids, if you're raising children. So, you know, I'm happy to kind of dig deeper. I know that was kind of a big gamut of like (laughs) childhood to now, but yeah, it's all a process and I'm still processing it. So I'm so glad and I'm so grateful that you're sharing your story, Sarah. And I, I'm drawn right in and I see you in that family as a child. And I see you growing into the woman that you are and having this intuition awakening and the support with your intuitive healer and I love that you are coming back to yourself. And for me, I know that there can be a continual coming back to oneself. That is true for me. Um, How is it for you? Is it a coming back to yourself and now you're here or is it a continuing process or what is your, what is your sense of selfhood these days? It's definitely a continuing because there are times where I feel unstoppable and, you know, it, 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 it depends on who I surround myself with. That's been a huge thing. I mean, not only with the letting go of my parents and the relationship that we had, I've had to do that with several like friends and other relationships. And, you know, I think that that's also part of a bigger journey But part of me is like, am I letting them go because they're not healthy relationships or do they represent something familiar from a relationship with my parents? Right. Mm -hmm. So that part has been hard and how I show up now is challenging. You know, I, you know, especially things like social media, which I know a lot of people struggle with social media in general, because a lot of people lack, you know, self-confidence and, putting themselves out there on camera and, you know, being a business owner, you know, that's like, that's how we market ourselves today, you know, is putting ourselves out there. I mean, that's just the way of the world. So I do struggle with that a lot. And I think it's, you know, meeting people like yourself um, and other people in, you know, some of the similar groups that we are in just constantly seeking other people to like cheer you on, right? Because you never really had that cheerleader in your life. I'll notice when I'm having a teaching moment with the kids or they're having an emotional moment. And at first I would, you know, when they were really young, I struggled with how to deal with that. But now knowing what I know, like I'm able to be present with them and allow them to self-soothe and regulate their their emotions in the way that like they need to so that they can grow up to be like emotionally healthy adults so I find my courage and my strength when I have to kind of go in business mode or mom mode but when I'm sitting with myself like there there are still really sad moments and I've let and I've come to appreciate them you know I study like the mind body for me being in interiors and feng shui, my, you know, my thing is mind, body, home and creating space, safe space in my home for me to have those moments, to let it, cr- to cry it out, not keep it in. Because if I cry it out, if I hold it in, it's going to stick in my body somewhere. And those are other things. I've had a lot of body things I've had to work through, you know, interestingly, my hips, you mm. know, which deal with the root and your, your safety and, the hips represent a lot of father energy, which I find fascinating, you know? So there's Mm -hmm. still things to be released out of that. I don't think I could be where I am and have the perspective I have if I didn't have like some grounded spiritual energy surrounding me. I think that's been my biggest, like my biggest support system is having some sort of faith. And I think just having the business outlet, sharing with others, helping others, and raising my children has been the big, big factors in part of my healing. So, but yeah, I, it's definitely a work in progress. 
it's not like I'm all and powerful. <laughs> I still go back and want to crawl inside a shell sometimes for sure. Oh, well, right away in contact with you, I have noticed not just today, but in times before I've noticed your vulnerability and I mentioned courage earlier when we were talking today, but not to overuse that word. It's for me receiving you. I feel this willingness of being honest and vulnerable in a very powerful way. And for me, that lands as courageous. And I admire that in Mm. you. And as you're talking about root and grounding and raising your children consciously and being aware of releasing father energy and hips and having faith, I continue to feel this wealth of, if we were to use a different word from power and courage, for me, it would be strength, this wealth of strength. Mm. Yeah. No, I appreciate you saying that because that's, that's really what I'm striving for. I want to be seen as this driving force and powerful, like, you know, look what I've overcome, but it's not like, not in an egoic way. Like, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? More like it can be done. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people might look at abuse from a physical perspective and say, well, you aren't be or abused in that manner. And some people might think that's worse necessarily, you know, abuse is abuse period Mm -hmm. (laughs) in whatever way you want to look at it. And everybody has a story in some, some manner. And I think that, yeah, just like I said, it's, it's not an egoic. I want to be powerful and strong and courageous. It's just, I want to show others that like you can overcome it. And that if you've, if you've dealt with being raised by a parent that exhibits these, this sort of personality, like it, it, like your feelings are validated, but you can overcome it. And I think step one is having awareness. And I think that's really step one in any situation that we're trying to overcome is Mm -hmm. if you have some awareness around it, then you can start working towards whatever it is you want to change about it. So, yeah, I like that though. I kind of have this vision of when you were saying that, like me roaring, like a tiger kind of. (laughs) Yes. I hear your roar (laughs) and I love it. (laughs) Bringing awareness to narcissism. What would you say the definition of narcissism is? Oh, as you're asking that, I can picture that like checklist that I uh, had found. I think that in its simplest framework, I think a narcissist is someone who lacks empathy, period. To elaborate on the definition, I think that they, well, one, I want to also say, and again, I'm not a mental health expert or a psychotherapist in any way, but from my research, what I've learned is it's not something they actually can be diagnosed with. It's a personality trait, just as you know, someone could exhibit a sad personality or a joyful one, you know, or so it's just, it's just a personality that you're dealing with. Now there's definitely a spectrum, right? Because in some ways we all, you know, if you have an ego, you can, you know, be narcissistic at times. Right. But I think understanding that uh, I feel like it's such a big topic. It's hard to condense into a definition one, they lack empathy. Two, their reality is very skewed. And what they do, though, is they project that onto you as your reality being skewed, mm-hmm. right? They they gaslight a lot. You know, that's not true. It wasn't that way. A lot of them are lie. They will straight up lie to you to protect their sense of reality. And understanding that their reality is so skewed it it allows me to have a little bit of compassion and empathy for them. And that's how I know when my parent, when my brother or my mother, like, you're just like your father. I'm not like, cause I actually exhibit empathy. And that to me is like definition number one, but you know, they can be very antagonistic. They can, you know, be one uppers, you know? So like in the very like minimal, they can do that. But when they're on the further end of the spectrum, you know, being raised by one for me, just, it you know, just not tending to like, there's no emotional attachment. 
one thing I found really interesting in my research too, is that they really don't, it's like they only need something from you when they need something from you. So if you, especially as a child who has needs and, you know, look, 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 and how dare you, I'm busy, you know, like kind of push you away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I'm getting a little off topic, but Mm -hmm. you know, just, just the empathy is really the biggest for me Mm -hmm. from a definition standpoint. Mm -hmm. That's such an important part of the definition of narcissism as I understand it. And And yes, I agree with you as you're saying, it is the definition that really makes a difference. So when we're talking about narcissism and the lack of empathy and you having been a child raised in an environment like that, and there are other children who are raised in environments like that, you've spoken a little bit about what it was like. And if you tune into that lack of empathy Do you get a body sense of what that was for you as a little girl learning and growing? How were you with a father charming and sometimes saving the day, but also not having time for your needs and not really feeling into your experience? Yeah, I mean, I confusion is what comes up you know, especially when they do that, they rein you in with their charm and then, you know, have no use for you later that day. I spent a lot of time alone in my room um, because it was easier. I, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, there was a lot of walking on eggshells around them. Don't say the wrong thing, you know, or you could just feel his energy if he was having an off day or if he was in the garage working on the car and he like dropped a hammer and then that mm-hmm. would like upset him and it would like snowball into more like disasters happening, you know, it's like law of attraction <laughs> not <laughs> in a good way. Right. And so I just remember, you know, spending a lot of time in my rooms, really connected with like my stuffed animals. When I, as a teenager, never wanted to be home. I wanted to be out of that environment desperately. I knew as soon as I turned 18, I was leaving and I did. Um, I think like a week after my birthday, I was out. (laughs) Um, And the interesting thing was in my 20s is when I really connected, probably had the better, that was probably the better part of our relationship because there was distance. Um, I was getting some freedom and they were too. They were getting freedom from having raised a child the last 18 years. Now, my brother was still there, but again, my brother was quiet, kept the peace. He was easy, right? So even though our relationship was really better, I guess is is the best word I could use. Um, I was filled with a lot of anxiety in my 20s. Now, I think people in their 20s are anxious anyways, because you're like, okay, world, here I am. Now what, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But having to kind of reprogram myself, knowing, well, not knowing that that's Mm -hmm. what was needed. Mm -hmm. I was turning to alcohol and I was a cigarette smoker for, since I was 15. And so were my parents. So on that level, I connected with them and we had fun times. We drank, Mm -hmm. we hung out, right? So there was this decade where there was a stronger, stronger bond than we had ever experienced. And it was finally like, oh, wow, I must be doing something right now. Like my parents actually enjoy my company and, you know, we're getting along. And there were times when I would be hanging out and I would recollect stories of, you know, an abusive situation where I was like, oh, dad, that was, I still can't believe that happened. You know, just trying on some level to connect with him completely unconscious that it was like a screwed up story that like, I shouldn't be (laughs) really Mm -hmm. enjoying telling. Right. And then when I was 30, I had my first child and that's when things changed. That's really when I started like waking up. Right. And then I just turned 40 a few weeks ago and I thought, okay, I'm not going into this decade carrying this. Like we are, (laughs) we are like starting fresh, all new, fresh, fresh me, I'm stepping into my power. Like I'm, we're going to fix this. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of the progression through the decades, but as a child, yeah, just never really wanted to be around them, Mm -hmm. you know, and I've heard my whole life, you know, things like, 
you know, this has always been your fault. You have a track record of this, like, and mm. that that's reference referencing my rebellious teenage years, but it was only an acting out to the situation, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One that someone who's a narcissist would never own. So for 40 years, just thinking everything was your fault and there's something wrong with you, right? You're too sensitive. You're too this, you're too that, you're a pain in the ass, all of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so just leaving all that behind, because I know none of it's true mm-hmm. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. you know, Good but feeling you. it in my body, I mean, from an anxious standpoint, I would always feel things in my gut, you know, that solar plexus area, your point of power. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's where it would hit me when I, mm-hmm. you asked that very early on and I kind of got a little away from it, but yeah, I just mm-hmm. that a loss of power. And I hear the waking up that happened over the course of your life. And coming to this knowing for sure, yes, I am going to live in my true authentic power and none of that Mm -hmm. is true. And I'm leaving it all behind. What grace. Yeah. What a conscious (laughs) step. And it feels relieving. Two years ago, it would have felt scary. Mm -hmm. Right. But now I'm at a point where like, I'm ready. I'm ready to just be me. So the world is lucky. The world is lucky for you to be you. Thank you, Ray. (laughs) (laughs) And all oh, thank you. And all the way through too, I'm I see that little girl who I hear enjoyed spending time alone. And I imagine that you as a little girl felt safe alone. Is is that part of the story? Oh, sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it plays out still now like i'm a a very much like being home i consider myself introverted i would much rather be at home i'm a homebody you know Mm -hmm. um yeah i felt safe and i think my bedroom was my safe space and it's so interesting that that's what i do for people now is creating safe sacred space for people at home because Mm -hmm. you have to get it from somewhere (laughs) yeah you know if your sense of home is one part of your room like have that place to go to whether you want to call it an altar space or meditation Mm -hmm. space you know have it have somewhere you can go what a beautiful tie-in and I know I just tied that (laughs) in like just now right I love it (laughs) Uh, we you and I were talking earlier before that I grew up with an abusive parent as well different story but one of the similarities that I feel with you is that I, I spent a lot of time as a little girl arranging my objects and I would, I was very close with my stuffed animals as well, but there is something so miraculous about just taking my small amount of possessions and putting them just so, and then feeling that peace within and without. And so when I hear you about feng shui and designing spaces that heal and feel safe. I resonate with that, how precious that is to be able to create that space for yourself and then to share that gift with the world. I love that. Arranging spaces creates a sense of order to what appears to be chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And even if it is just rearranging objects in your room or setting your stuffies just so, you know, it just, it's a sense of order where there's chaos, you know, Mm -hmm. and I'm still like that now. It's sometimes borderline a little like compulsive, you know, the, the, the throw pillows on the couch, you know, they're, I'm probably three times a day, you know, in there (laughs) arranging karate chopping. So they have a nice fluff, you know, it's, (laughs) it's interesting that we're talking about it because I've never really had that awareness of probably why I'm, I'm like that. Like I'm very organized and things have to, you know, they have to be set up a certain way. So that that's, I love this moment we're sharing because it's kind of bringing some awareness to me as to, again, why I do the things I do, like where that stems mm-hmm. from. So that's beautiful. Thank you for pointing that out. And I also hear that there was an awakening or maybe something in the mind that grew a bit more spacious around the birth of your first child, where you could start to see through this facade a little more clearly, the facade of your family of origin, the facade of the relationships that 
um, weren't really working. Um, is there some truth to that? Like a, a mental clarity that happened for you? Yeah, I think when my first child was born, I think I didn't know what to do. You know what I mean? And when he would cry, I struggled with what to do with them. I mean, I, I eventually learned like the whole, you know, swaddling and the shushing, you know, the five S's. I don't know if you're familiar with, but like, you know, I would practice these things and it would work. And what I remember hearing my whole upbringing was, oh my God, you never stopped crying. It was constant crying. We thought you were colic, but you weren't colic. You just, you cried incessantly. And I heard that my whole life. And it brought me right back to that. I'm like, okay, well, maybe this is karma. Like, this is what I did, you know, as a child, I just cried nonstop. So maybe that's what my son's going to do, you know? And I had this, like, like, am I being punished? And it was like, before I really understood what like true karma was, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> kind of blaming that situation, like blaming myself, like, oh, well, you were a pain in the ass when you were little. So you're going to get a child that cries, you know? And then I just started, and then I would kind of, I don't, I can't explain it. I just started becoming conscious of these stories. Like it's just a story in my head, you know, because it's what I've been taught. And so I just, I feel like I just started paying attention to what was happening. And then as he kind of got into his toddler years and was a little bit more troublesome from, you know, just getting into things. And my reaction was anger at first mm -hmm. um, and almost narcissistic tendencies, like, how dare you? Like I've, I need to sleep or I need to get this done. And you're over here causing a mess, you know? And again, that feels so icky. Like, I don't like the way that feels. And I think it's just, it's really hard to put in words because I think a lot of it was just so, so very subtle, but really part of the bigger picture that I was going through. Um, because initially my whole journey, my awakening really started with my career or so mm -hmm. I thought you know, I had made a, a huge career change and or at the time was desiring a career change and then had a kid. And that that's the thing I have to keep remembering is to give myself grace because all of this is happening at the same time. Like there's so much happening at once. It was like, had two kids, career change, you know, reliving my childhood traumas and working through those and raising myself and making sure I'm still attending to my marriage. And <laughs> it was, it's, it's crazy when you really sit back and think about how much we're going through every single day, especially when you're trying to work through some trauma and rain, I'm not working with a therapist. Like <laughs> I just never reached out to one. And when I listened to like Dr. Romani talk about, you know, who studied narcissism for 20 years. And she's like, if you had a parent, like, it's not good. You need a therapist. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't have a therapist. And I've, I think I've been relying on my intuition you know, mm -hmm. that whole practice and just really staying in touch with that side to kind of help guide me through this. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing when you actually sit down and think about it. Like, as we're talking, I'm like, wow, I am pretty strong and brave. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't give myself enough credit. <laughs> yes. Well, good. I'm glad that you can hear that in yourself and to recognize that you deserve and you're worth all of the credit in the world of this attunement that you've given to yourself. Just looking at your own parenting as your first child was growing up and being curious about, oh, this doesn't feel so great doing it this way. It takes mm -hmm. so much empathy for oneself to have that kind of attunement to one's child and then to make a conscious decision of what could be better. What does my intuition tell me? That awareness is completely opposite to a narcissistic personality style or wherever a person falls on the spectrum of narcissism, what you're describing is healthy. Yeah. And another, you know, just from a parenting perspective, you know, there are, um, and I don't want to make any claim to be the perfect parent or, you know, I never get upset or yell at my kids. I mean, I'm still a human being and it's going to happen and it still does. You know, there are definitely times that if I'm, if it's not, you know, raising my voice, maybe it's just something I said that 
three seconds later, I'm like, oh, that was kind of hurtful. Like I probably shouldn't, it could have just been the tone of my voice, right? Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's these very subtle reactions or a look, you know, that your parent Mm -hmm. might give you or whatever. But the difference is, again, between someone who's narcissistic and empathetic is the empath is going to turn around and apologize. Hey, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You know, I, I was wrong. That Mm -hmm. would never happen the other way around. And I was speaking with a mental health expert, psychotherapist, and she said that there are studies now where just that, that apology, that moment that you can like that connection with your child is going to trump what like you know your reaction Mm -hmm. is being able to apologize and share with them hey like I was wrong you didn't do anything wrong I just was having a bad reaction I was in a different headspace at the moment like Mm -hmm. you know it's not you that was me Mm -hmm. I own it and you know there's studies now showing that like just that three second apology and Mm -hmm. moment with your child is going to trump what happened. And it's almost like they can let it go because they're not like feeling shamed and guilted into thinking like, Oh, I did something wrong. I upset mom. And then they hold it in, they don't share it. And then they hold it in their body and -hmm. then they grow up with it over time, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, again, I don't claim to be perfect. Just trying to recognize myself in the moment and being aware of it when I'm not, when I'm not right, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, and it's not just, it's not just about the apology. It's also a teaching moment that when they do that, because they're going to have their moments, you know, you've modeled to them how to repair it, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like working double duty. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. And we get to be human together. And right. what, what an asset to share with our children that they get to be human. We get to be human yes. as mothers and parents, they get to be human We're filled with humanity. Let's celebrate this. Yeah. So when looking at narcissism and your experiences in your family of origin, all the way to this day, what would you say is a healing that has happened in relationship with your father or something that you would like to happen that you imagine would be healing or just reflecting on healing in the realm of narcissism, what is true for you? I'm really, I think I'm actually at a point where I'm kind of struggling with that. I'm struggling with what I want my relationship to look like from, from my personal healing. I just want peace. And I think that's going to be an ongoing process. At the moment, I have very limited contact. I would say about every four or six months, I get a text you know, it's usually not very nice. Haven't heard from you. Me and your mother are doing just fine. Not that you care, just very mm-hmm. like, and and honestly, when I had put that offer out there to do, to do some interviews on the topic, that's really what sparked it was a text. Mm-hmm. And I was very firm um, in my response and it was very simple. And I have said this for the last year and a half to both my parents that my door is always open, but I will, you can only enter as long as it's met with love, kindness, and respect. And I have stood by that a hundred percent. And I feel like it keeps being like, it keeps falling on deaf ears for them (laughs) because I still get, you know, like I said, every four or six months, I get these texts like, you're wrong. I can't believe you're dumping us as parents, things like that. And, you know, I have certainly tried rain to explain my side, but to explain my side from my perspective is really difficult for someone in that position to hear because Mm -hmm. it just makes no sense to them. Mm -hmm. And again, I have this like higher spiritual perspective that they would never understand. They're just not there. They're too they're not conscious enough. And I, and I, I hate to say that I, I, I don't want that to come out as I'm conscious and you're not, I'm better. And you're not like, it's not like that. Mm-hmm. That's not what I mean. It's just, they would just never get it. You know what I mean? So my response to that last text is what sparked kind of my, I'm going to talk about this now because it feels like the next step because I was so mm-hmm. proud of myself. I, I said, I, I truly do love you. And I want nothing but peace for you but this conversation is now closed. Mm. And that's it. 
I never want to go backwards. I never want to talk about with them particularly, you know, there's no, there's no family therapy for someone who's a narcissist, who's narcissistic. It's just not, they would never agree to something like that. So there's no reason to talk about it with them. Mm -hmm. I can talk about it with my community or, or, you know, my friends, people that are supportive of me, but with that person, there's no great way to move forward. And so that's where I'm struggling. I don't know how to move forward right now. For me, it's no contact Mm -hmm. because I'm not, I'm not strong enough, right. To, to sit at Thanksgiving and deal without, deal with that without having a reaction. Mm -hmm. Right. I know, I know I'm not strong enough. I will probably react. And that's what Mm -hmm. I'm trying to avoid because those are the parts of me that I'm trying to transcend. Right. Mm -hmm. So for right now, it's no contact. And I think about, you know, what it could look like. I don't know. I think I want a relationship with them, but it would never look like what it ever looked like before. So there's just, there's so much unknown that I don't even know what a relationship would look like with them. Mm-hmm. You know, the way we used to hang out, drink in and smoke it, like that's not part of my life anymore at all. Mm-hmm. I don't do any of that. Like I quit (laughs) drinking. I quit, which is crazy. I mean, right. I was smoking at the age 15. I was drinking, you know, it wasn't an alcoholic per se, but every night I would have a couple glasses of wine and there's nothing wrong with that, but Mm -hmm. I have an addictive personality. So for me, that wasn't healthy. So I I feel like I wouldn't even know how to really connect with them or relate to them. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I'm at. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just want peace. And I, I hate saying this, but I feel good that with a lot of distance, mm-hmm. I feel like I've grieved my alive parents. So I feel kind of okay with where things are. And there's, mm-hmm. there's, there's some guilt in that. So it's like another thing that I have to like <laughs> kind of work through is now the guilt and the shame of even saying that out loud. When, and fear of being judged for saying that, like, how dare you say that about your parents? Well, mm-hmm. it's not like a lovey-dovey relationship, you know? And I think only people who are in those types of relationships would understand that, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the hard part too, is I'm in this, you know, I feel like the relationship between my mother and my brother, you know, of course they're caught in the middle. And because they are still in close contact, obviously my mother lives with him, you know, she has, she is also dealing with living with a narcissist, but she is completely unaware of it. She is at the point of, in my opinion, brainwashed, like she can't, she will never crawl out of this. And I don't know if she will ever come to any sort of realization about what's going on. I don't know if maybe she eventually hears a podcast of hearing her daughter talk about it, that it would ever truly sink in. Um, Because I have tried to explain my side, but it's just, it falls on deaf ears. They're they're not going to hear it. They're not going to absorb it. Mm -hmm. And again, my brother playing that peacemaker role, it's, he doesn't want to hear it. Just I'm staying out of it. You know, you do you, dad does him. We'll just, you know, for a while, there was a time where I just wanted them to hear my side. Like if they just heard my side, like they would get it. Mm -hmm. And, but the reality is they're, they won't. And I think it, it really boils down to a choice. I don't think they choose to, because it's just easier because if they don't want the situation to turn on them. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was recently reading, I cannot remember the book because I tend to read like 10 books at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But the history of a scapegoat which I totally am, you know, like black sheep, scapegoat. That's me. I mean, when are we going to like, when are we going to applaud the scapegoat? Okay. Like that's (laughs) what I want to know because we are strong. We carry so much weight. Right. But I never knew like the biblical hit story of the scapegoat. Like they literally would bring in a goat to the town center for every, the community would like come around the goat and they would cast all their like, negative decisions and desires and just anything that they felt like they needed to rid themselves that they cast it on the goat and then the goat would be taken and like walked wherever into the fields or the desert or wherever they lived and 
that's the story of a scapegoat. I mean, that was a very like condensed uh, storyline, but Mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, wow, that's so true. Like, because they can't look like that's their biggest thing is they're so walled off from their own emotional state that they can't even look at themselves. It's just a huge defensive wall. Mm -hmm. So any issue that's theirs, I'll put it on you. You were the one causing the trouble in the family. You have the track record. You did this. Mm -hmm. You, you, you know, this is Mm -hmm. so like you, Mm -hmm. right? So I think I had to like finally embrace that. Like, yeah, I am the scapegoat, Mm -hmm. you know, and turn it into a strength more than a weakness and just do my best to transcend it. Like I refuse to pass this on to my kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing the work. I'm doing the Mm -hmm. work and I'm here for it. You know what? I finally just kind of surrendered and I said, look, this is what I'm here to do. Let's do it. Cause I'm not carrying this with me next lifetime. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I think to get back to your question, like, what do you, what do you see for the future? Like just peace and letting go, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, just keep surrendering to it. So (sighs) it's tough work though. And how is your heart in this tough work? It's good. Mm -hmm. I am learning. I'm still learning to have a little more compassion for myself. I tend to give to everybody else more than myself, but I really had to recognize that my family, my husband and my kids, I had this moment a few, probably a year ago where we were pulling Oracle cards out of a Mm -hmm. deck with like an intuition mastermind that I was part of. And we did it in like circle fashion. So whoever you pulled, you read for the person that was next in line. And the card was like these three little angels, like holding hands and they were in a circle and, you know, it was just real vibrant and stars. And um, it was a beautiful card. And it, you know, my insight from that card that I drew was like, here I am looking for validation and love from a parent who doesn't know how to give it. Mm-hmm. not just a parent, both parents, but I have these three people in my life who are dancing around me, giving me all of their unconditional love, like unconditional, like growing up, it was conditioned love. Now I have unconditional love and I wasn't seeing it. I was too worried on fixing that. And so I try to live in this place of not only am I not carrying this into the next life or this next decade, but like I'm creating a new life beyond like generationally, like, and it starts with me, like I'm starting over and I'm carrying that through my heart. I hear so through much. my husband and my kids. Uh-huh. Oh, what a beautiful family you have, your husband and your children. And I hear so much compassion and I, I'm bearing witness to you taking this family legacy of narcissism and transforming it with compassion into a new family story, one where you're feeling unconditional love from your husband, from your children, and I imagine from yourself as well. Yeah. That's you stated that beautifully. (laughs) And I love hearing that that's what I'm doing. Like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. And I can't wait to see how it unfolds, you know, and I'm okay. Like you said, I'm, I'm acknowledging this trauma from my childhood with compassion. I'm not here talking about this to get back at my parents for not raising me the way I wanted to be, or they did it all wrong. Like, it's not about that for me, you know, because I know deep down they're just detached from their selves Mm -hmm. and their love for themselves and probably the love they didn't receive as children either. Like we're all just walking around with that. And I think that's why I'm so like, I'm not going to let it happen with my kids because it is intergenerational. Like you see it passed on. I saw it when my first son was born, it was coming up, it was happening. Like I was not parenting great. Like I didn't know what I was doing and I was reactive parenting instead of conscious parenting. 
Mm. And I'm so grateful for the awareness because who knows what my life would look like 10 years later, you know, and have to do like damage control. So it is a beautiful unfolding and to be determined on the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, here we are in the outcome as it unfolds before us and around us and in us. And I'm so happy that you're sharing your journey. It feels good. This talk was good to kind of get it out there, you know? And I hear you speaking often about the spiritual, about faith and your spiritual awareness. Is there more that you would like to say about what spirituality is true for you or where you're at in that opening? Yeah. I mean, it really started for me with a desire to change careers. I sort of alluded to that before. And I heard the the most random thing happened to me. I got like a messenger, Facebook messenger DM from someone I didn't even know. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Never heard of this lady. And she sent me a link to an interview with Wayne Dyer and Esther Hicks. So my journey really started out of a manifestation law of attraction type of desire, like changing, changing what's going on in my life. Like I want, and it was more um, materialistic things. Like I want to, I want more money and I want a better career and I want to feel fulfilled. You know, I want to feel like I have some purpose in my work and it really quickly evolved into like my life's story. And so I dug much deeper into, you know, a course in miracles and Marion Williamson's work and Gary Zukoff. And so I really went deep into some soul work. I dabbled in past life regression therapy, and I'm a huge fan of Ainsley McLeod and his work. And then of course the intuition work realize I, I realized I was seeking all this information. And then when I found out about a coach near me who was teaching intuition, I was like this I read her book and I was like, wow, this really resonates because she takes a scientific approach and really modern day analysis of, of the human world that we live in. And just re- like I said to her, I was like, I don't feel like I need to do so much research. I feel like knowing this and having access to my intuition is it's like my own, I'm my own guru now. Like I can just tap into it and I can have questions answered. So that was a huge part of my spiritual development was just honing in and really acknowledging my intuition, recognizing the body pangs, the energy pangs that I get. Louise Hay was huge for me, especially as it comes to, you know, mind and body and how to heal. Like you know, I have a lot of, did have a lot of chronic pains here and there. And once you find like the emotional attachment, why they're there, ah, oh, it's, it's like brilliant to me. And it, it fascinates me on such a level. So then when I, then I realized, okay, if I could find a way to do interior design and like spiritual development, (laughs) like I got to find a way to blend the two because they both fascinate me. And then I started reading about some feng shui work and I was like, okay, I think I found it. I think I found it here. So, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. It started off with just, you know, trying to manifest a different lifestyle (laughs) <laughs> and then it just evolved into just really deep soul work. And I think for mm. the last couple of years, this, this stuff with my family, it's really brought up like, kind of like that dark night of the soul stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The things that really keep us down. And I felt that, like, I felt like my energy was just very depleted all the time. I was like lacking a lot of joy and just, but I was still so consumed with that those works. Like I wanted to understand, I wanted to understand, but then I got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm feeling like I'm happy I'm doing this work, but it's, it's like bringing me down a little bit. (laughs) So I was like, what what did I enjoy when I first started? And it was like Esther Hicks. So I just started re-listening to Esther again. And it's, and she's get, she gets me like pumped up, you know, like just, you know, I love hearing her speak and, um, But it's interesting to hear her now from when I first started, because I listened to her with a different set of ears, you know? Uh uh So, so yeah, I think for me, just, I have to start my day with that material, whether it's books or, Mm -hmm. you know, a podcast or a YouTube video of just Mm -hmm. positive affirmation, whatever. It doesn't even be affirmations, just positive Mm -hmm. reading material. That's the way I start my day. So, Mm -hmm. and of course, meditation. 
Rain, your specialty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as you know, I love meditation. <laughs> Born and raised with it. That is one of the blessings of my life. I've I grew up in a spiritual family and and that rings true oh. for me all the way through. It, a great asset that I was given. Oh, yeah. I love that. Beautiful. Yeah, I was not. <laughs> But it is something I'm sharing with my kids as well. So I'm, I'm grateful to give that. They have some great breathing techniques and mindfulness mm -hmm. to like get them through their little days at school. And mm -hmm. I love sharing that. I think I think children is probably my favorite little students to like share my knowledge and wisdom with because mm -hmm. they're just so receptive to it. Mm -hmm. And it's like they know. They're like, yeah, mm -hmm. duh, just like mm -hmm. breathe. How about we end with some gratitude? What are you grateful for today or any time in your life? What gratitude is present for you? Oh, that's an easy one. I, if I did not have my spiritual faith, none of this would be possible. I am grateful for that Facebook DM from a random stranger that opened my world to a whole, like a whole nother world. <laughs> mm. I mean, that's truly what I'm grateful for because none of this would be possible. My healing, how I show up as a parent, how I show up for myself, for my clients, for my husband. I mean, even he just has, he's a very quiet man, but I can, he hears me talk and he takes action, but he doesn't talk about it. And I'll just see it. I'm like, oh, look at him, like <laughs> manifesting things over there and changing his attitude about something. Like it's, I love that just my presence and my being and what I find that I'm passionate about is everybody's receiving it mm -hmm. without intentionally putting it out there. Mm -hmm. So just, I'm grateful that I have the ability to do that. And I'm excited to share more. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> and I see this movement of gratitude through you and I hear it in your voice and I resonate with it. I'm so grateful for you. Is there anything you want to add before I end the recording? I don't think so. I just wish everyone out there listening that if you're going through this to know that nothing, the biggest, the biggest thing is nothing is your fault. You did nothing to deserve this. And there are people out there that can relate to you. And I think it's so imperative to find those people to help you move through it. Whether it was a parent, uh, a spouse, a brother, that there are, there are a lot of us out there going through it. And I think the more we can be brave to talk about it, the more light will shed on it. And just like anything, you know, with awareness comes healing. Your light is such a gift. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. It has been a great joy to have your presence here in this podcast. I welcome you to celebrate the joy and wisdom in your life exactly as it is. And I welcome you to feel loved, fully loved, exactly as you are. www.rainelizabeth.org